Ready? Take your seat and please, we're going to start right now. Good morning. My name is Matthew Eugene and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Today, our committee will be hearing testimony on intro 863, which would amend the administration code to prohibit uh, employment discrimination based on an individual reproductive choices. This bill aims to make a number of changes. The first section of intro 863, for instance, would expand the list of protected bases by adding sexual and reproductive health decisions to the list. Section 2 of the bill, meanwhile, expands the definition of sex sexual and reproductive health decisions. Under this section of, bill, of the bill, such a decision would now be classed as any decision by employee to receive services which are arranged for or offered or provided to individuals relating to the reproductive system and its functions, including but not limited to fertility-related medical procedures, family planning services and counseling, including but not limited to access to all medically approved birth control drugs and supplies, emergency contraception, sterilization procedures, pregnancy testing, sexually transmitted disease testing and treatment, abortion procedures, and HIV testing and counseling. By adding sexual and reproductive health decision to the list of protected categories, this bill aims to make it unlawful for employers to discriminate against their workers' actual and perceived sexual or reproductive health choice. We look forward to hearing from the administration on the guidance on the best way to strengthen these uh, protections. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the members of the committee, the members uh, who are here with us, the council members. We have council member Carlos, council member Rosenthal, and council member William, who is the sponsor of the bill. And at this time, I want to give uh, to council member William the opportunity to make a statement. Council member William, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Chair Eugene, Speaker Johnson, my colleagues, members of the committee, on all of you joining us today. I do want to take uh, some personal privilege to shout out uh, some family in the, in the audience, uh, my cousins from across the pond, also known as England, uh, my cousins Ian, his sons Joe, and his girlfriend Catherine. Uh, welcome. Um, uh, I am proud that we are hearing this profound bill today, will, which will serve to protect women and men from ever fearing whether their personal health and reproductive choices will risk their jobs. I want to thank a council member, uh, Majority Leader Cumbo and Council Members Rosenthal, who's been uh, working with me on this bill since uh, last year term, at the end of last year, actually, in the chair of the Women's Community, uh, Council Members Rivera and Chin, the chairs of the Women's Caucus, and uh, Council Member um, Rose, who are all co-primes on this bill. We put forward this bill, also known as the Boss Bill, to prohibit employee discrimination on the basis of sexual and reproductive health decisions. Sexual and reproductive health decisions would be defined as any decision by an employee to receive services which are arranged for, or offered, or provided to individuals relating to the reproductive system. <coughs> and its functions, including, but not limited to, fertility-related medical procedures, family planning and services and counseling, including, but not limited to, access to all medically approved birth control drugs and supplies, emergency contracep contraception, sterilization procedures, pregnancy testing, sexually transmitted disease, testing and treatment, abortion procedures, and HIV testing and counseling. Throughout the country, we have seen an erosion of rights and access for women, LGBT people, people of more color, and our immigrant brothers and sisters, and our Muslim and religious brothers and sisters as well. With Washington rolling back requirements for employers, it is incumbent upon us as leaders of our city, a city that serves as a beacon for protections of the most vulnerable among us, to ensure that our citizens never face retaliation to ensure that our citizens or our residents never face retaliation, unemployment, 
or discrimination for seeking much needed sexual and reproductive health care. Protecting against this discrimination is an urgent necessity, especially in the time of Trump and allowing discrimination, well, I would say in the time of Trump and those who support him, and allowing discrimination based on sexual and reproductive health decisions is clearly meant to deny women and all of our residents their human rights. An employer has no place in these deeply personal matters. The Boss Bill has earned praise from Planned Parenthood. I want to thank them as well, and I believe they'll be testifying uh, uh, soon. Among other organizations, Planned Parenthood, New York City President Laura McQuaid is quoted in the New York Daily News. With the Trump administration taking Direct aim at birth control access with the new rule permitting employees and universities to deny birth control for their employers and students. It has never been more critical for New York to stand up for the reproduction, reproductive health care access. Birth control is essential to being able to build the families and lives we want. 90% of women use birth control during their lives. All people have a right to access to birth control regardless of who they work for. End quote. The Boss Bill is a crucial piece of legislation that will prevent any workplace discrimination and protect the human rights of this impacted by the cruelty and caprice um, of the Trump administration and the far right. I look forward to today's hearing as we move the ball forward for all women and men in our city. I also do want to thank uh, Catholic Charities. They came to meet with me with their concerns. Uh, I told them this bill was eminently important and we'd move forward. But we were able to work with them to address the concerns they had and still uh, have a bill that Planned Parenthood could be proud of. So I'm, I'm thankful we were able to do that. Thank you again uh, to the chair. And that's the end of my, test my uh, opening statement. Thank you very much, Councilmember William, for sponsoring this very important bill. And I want to thank and congratulate also all the sponsors and those who work very hard with you to make this possible. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I want to mention also that, that this, today is a very busy day. I have uh, three public hearings, <laughs> two at the same time. I had to go to the chamber to uh, excuse myself because I got to respect the protocol at this time. I got another public hearing, and I sit in all three committees. And after this one, I got another one. So anyway, this is a very important hearing, and I'm pleased to be here. And again, to all of you who work hard to make this bill possible, thank you very much. Now we are going to call upon the administration to testify. But before that, uh, we are going to administer the, the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. Please state your name for the yeah. record. Good morning. My name is Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental Affairs and Policy at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Thank you, um, Chair Eugene and uh, Bill Sponsor, Council Member Jamani Williams, um, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and Council Member Ben Kalos for being here today to uh, discuss this bill which protects employees from discrimination on the basis of sexual and reproductive health decisions. Um, in my testimony, I define, uh, or I, I list the definition of uh, sexual and reproductive health decisions, but it's been said um, already, so I'll skip that. Um, the Commission and the Administration uh, support the goals of the legislation and the right to be free from discrimination based on one's decision to become pregnant, to undergo fertility-related medical procedures, to terminate a pregnancy, and or to seek treatment for sexually transmitted infections, including HIV AIDS. The Commission has prioritized the areas of pregnancy discrimination and disability discrimination over the last several years. The New York City Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which created an explicit right to, reason to a reasonable accommodation in the workplace for, quote, pregnancy, childbirth, and related medical conditions, unquote, went into effect in 2014. The Commission has broadly interpreted these protections to include accommodations for not only pregnancy and childbirth, but infertility treatment, miscarriage, abortion, recovery from childbirth, and lactation. In 2016, the Commission published legal enforcement guidance on pregnancy discrimination that explicitly clarifies the Commission's broad interpretation of these protections and provides transparency about one's rights and responsibilities under this provision of the city human rights law. The Commission's caseload of pregnancy discrimination cases has steadily increased in recent years, and the Commission has resolved several significant cases in this area. I'll share just two examples briefly today. Earlier this year, the Commission settled a case on behalf of a worker at Whole Foods for failing to accommodate her during her pregnancy. The worker had a high-risk pregnancy and was advised by her doctor to work shorter shifts. Whole Foods denied her the accommodation and then terminated her when she was hospitalized with pregnancy complications. The Commission required that the employer pay the worker a total of $35,000 in damages for both back pay and emotional distress, nearly $6,000 in attorney's fees to her counsel, and $25,000 in civil penalties to the City of New York. 
The agreement with the commission also requires Whole Foods to change its policies with regard to employee attendance and accommodations to comply with the city human rights law and to train all HR employees on the updated policies. And last year, the commission resolved a case on behalf of a flight attendant who worked for Endeavor Air, which operates out of JFK, and who was denied a place to pump breast milk close to where she worked. The commission obtained $20,000 in emotional distress damages for the flight attendant, collected $10,000 in civil penalties, and required national policy changes on, on pregnancy and lactation accommodations and training for its New York City-based staff. The commission is supportive of the goals of intro 863 to the extent it comports with existing law and is committed to ensuring that New Yorkers do not face discrimination based on their very personal choices to become pregnant, to have an abortion, to seek treatment or counseling for sexually transmitted infections. The commission re recommends that the protections proposed in the bill in the context of employment be extended to housing and public accommodations. The commission also looks forward to discussing with council meaningful strategies for effectively notifying both covered entities of their obligations and workers and other uh, tenants and people who frequent public accommodation of their rights under the city human rights law. We are grateful for the opportunity to be here today and to partner with the council to move the bill forward. Thank you for convening this, this hearing on, the, on this important issue and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh uh, uh, let me say that uh, this is uh, this is a very important uh, hearing because uh, we all know that this is a human right. People have the right to decide about the reproduction and about the uh, the health, the sexual health. And I think that we in the city council and the city of New York, we have the moral obligation to do everything that we can do to protect everybody, regardless of you know the socioeconomic situation. The, the, the work uh, positions. And I think this is a very important thing that we come all together to make sure that the right of everyone is respected with respect to the uh, reproductive uh, you know, uh, uh, decision. And thank you again for your testimony. Let me uh, uh, ask you, you say that in your testimony that uh, the commission caseload of forget pregnancy discrimination cases has steadily increased in recent years, and the commission has resolved several significant cases in the area. Could you please give us some detail about it, that? Could you elaborate about those cases? Sure. Um, so the, as I mentioned, the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, which made it explicit that pregnancy accommodations are required um, so long as they don't pose an undue hardship on the employer, went into effect in 2014, which gave the commission another tool to use to ensure that people um, have a right to an accommodation for their pregnancy in the workplace. Um, and I think partially as a result of that, of that law passing um, and the expansion of the commission's resources, um, we have seen an increase in cases filed at the commission alleging pregnancy discrimination. Um, I have some general numbers here. Um, in 2014 and 2015, um, there was approximately 38 filed cases for employment discrimination, um, for pregnancy discrimination and employment. Um, and in the following two years, that was up to 50 filed cases in employment, um, which doesn't account for you know the number of inquiries we receive or pre-complaint interventions um, or other ways that we might be able to negotiate or resolve a case. Um, so we are seeing an increase in cases. We are also seeing an increase in attorney filed cases at the commission. Um, the uh, council passed a law that allows for attorney's fees to be collected at the commission. So we're seeing um, cap representation um, and st very strong cases being brought to the commission on, uh, with regard to pregnancy discrimination and employment. Uh, uh, what do you think that uh, the causes of the increase of cases could be? I, I think, like I said, that, that the explicit protections in the Pregnant Worker Fairness Act, which has now been New York City um, passed it in 2014, I think there's now 23 such laws across the country. It's an it's a incredibly important and powerful protection because prior to that, um, under federal law, you basically had to show that you there was another person who was not pregnant who was given a similar accommodation. You couldn't be treated better, quote unquote, better because of your pregnancy than other workers. Now there's explicit protections for people to recover, um, to 
um, to have a healthy pregnancy while working and then also to recover from childbirth. Um, so I think having that law in place has been a, uh, has really changed um, the, the game in New York City. Um, I also think that we, you know, this is an area that is of particular importance to the commissioner. Um, she was previously a, a, a workers' rights attorney, and at, she said, um, and I can represent that at certain points in her private practice, the vast majority of her cases were pregnancy discrimination cases. Um, so the, one of the first publications we issued um, back when the commissioner started in March 2015 was a notice of rights about pregnancy, about this specific protection. Um, and then we published our legal enforcement guidance in 2016, which we hope to then um, move into rulemaking next year, um, which has been what we've heard from advocates has been incredibly useful in even advocating for their clients without having to come to the commission and bring a complaint. Um, I, I And I will also add that I think that there is a lot of um, misunderstanding about pregnant workers' rights in the workplace. Um, they, uh, I think it is a challenging area. I think there's this is one of the areas where we actually see overt discrimination, um, where employers are sort of stepping in and saying, I don't think you should be doing this, and sort of making decisions for people as opposed to the pregnant worker and their doctor kind of coming to a decision about what is, is best for them. Uh, you just m mentioned some aspect of policies at the federal level. But are you aware of any policy changes uh, at the federal level that may threaten access to reproductive choices in addition to what you just mentioned? Um, well, unfortunately, we're seeing um, you know narrowing of access to rights in across different um, issue areas with respect to um, the promulgation of rules at the federal level. Um, you know, there's been some Supreme Court decisions that have um, given, um, you know, even privately held um, corporations the right to exclude certain kinds of care in their insurance policies. Um, so I think there there is a real movement um, both with, you know, our federal administration and also the, you know, the makeup of the Supreme Court. I think there's a lot of concerns that um, we will see a further chipping away of of reproductive rights. Um, with respect to these types of bills, I have not seen anything at the federal level um, around discrimination based on reproductive health decisions that um, proposed. But you know, I, I think that we are all sort of uh, on edge regularly about what the next sort of proposed rule or or decision might be. Uh, intro uh, or H sixty three. We all agree this is a wonderful bill. But uh, do you think that you know the intro uh, uh, 863 effectively address the issues of discrimination based on uh, reproductive life uh, choices? I think so. You know, there we we want to work with uh, council and also in consultation with the law department, of course, to ensure that um, that the language of the bill reflects sort of our shared interest in ensuring that people do not face discrimination based on um, reproductive or sexual health decisions um, and. I, you know, we, we agree with the goals of the bill um, and, and seek to support it. So what is, do you have, a, do you have any recommendation, any uh, advice on what uh, can be done in addition to that to ensure that the right of people uh, are respected in terms of uh, reproductive life? One recommendation that we added um, that I noted in our testimony is, is to consider expanding these protections um, beyond the employment context um, to housing and public accommodations as well. Um, and I think you know we are amenable to having further conversations about um, what other ways we might be able to strengthen the bill or um, strengthen the commission's ability to enforce the, the law. Yeah, uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh, you know, <laughs> it's getting cold, huh? <laughs> Outside. So, in terms of a discrimination based on uh, sexual reproduction, uh, uh, sexual uh, reproductive life decision, that can happen in jobs and you know hospital anywhere in the housing and even in school. But uh, can you give us uh, an example of cases in which an individual was discriminated against in housing or public accommodation based on sexual or uh, reproductive health decision? Um, as we sort of discussed this bill internally, we were trying to explore different scenarios. And they, these are not 
the example I'll provide is not one that I've seen at the commission, but we were thinking about the context in which someone might seek medical treatment from a provider and the provider looks at one's medical history and sees that they had had a, an abortion, for example, um, and the medical provider then determines that they are they do not wish to, to um, take that person on as a patient. Um, you know, medical providers are public accommodations um, like anyone else um, who has a business or provides a service. Um, so we would want to um, consider expanding the bill to address those kinds of circumstances. Thank you very much. Let me call on Council Member William for some questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you so much for uh, your testimony. And I've worked with the uh, uh, the commission before, and we've done some, some great work protecting domestic violence victims and, and veterans, so, and so I'm very glad that we can be uh, doing uh, this again. I, I Wait, there's one thing I wanted to read into the record. Uh, I'm sorry, this is um, from an op-ed that we're working on, I want to make sure it's on the record. Just know that this is a, not a hypothetical situation. Uh, in general, the, in the United States and even in New York, employees, primarily women, have been targeted uh, for employment discrimination because of their personal reproductive health decisions. Michelle McCusker, a woman in Queens, was fired from a religious school in New York for becoming pregnant outside of marriage. And a woman in Wisconsin was fired for using in vitro fertilization. Without specific protections against such actions, they fail, fall into the gaps of assistant law. So I just wanted to make sure I lifted up the voices uh, of those women that had to deal with this. Um, well, the, uh, did my question was kind of um, what the councilman was asking about other ways that we can um, protect uh, employees' reproductive choices. But I didn't want to expand a little bit. I hadn't thought about housing and jobs. Um, which is, I mean, I hadn't heard about this issue until someone brought it to my attention last year. And so, uh, and the same thing with the veterans. Is there any way you can expound a little bit on what other examples you think in housing or jobs? Have you heard of any, and, and I'm sorry, jobs, you said housing, what was the other one? Uh, public accommodations. Public accommodations. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly around housing, are there any anecdotal things you've heard about how that may be affecting people? So I haven't heard anecdotally, um, but you know we might not be the best ones to report on sort of those kinds of anecdotes. I would imagine advocates or um, you know even council members, if they've had constituents come to them, um, in the housing context, I could imagine um, in the context of shelter, if there are shelters that um, you know privately funded or you know that receive private money, might not want to. Um, allow someone to stay if they disagree with certain decisions. So I'm thinking more in the context of um, of a housing provider in the shelter context, perhaps, than of a private housing provider, um, or, or sorry, a, more of a landlord-tenant situation. Mm -hmm. So um, the impetus for adding areas to increase was just kind of a brainstorming of what could happen in, in, in scenarios? Yes, and I also think that we are generally reluctant to add certain protections in some contexts and not the other, um, and sort of wait for the problems to arise. I think if we're thinking about this, if we're prioritizing this as an area of expanded jurisdiction, um, we'd like to try to be consistent unless we're intentionally excluding it because we have reasons to intentionally exclude it. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. That's it for me. I really appreciate the support. I did also want to shout out uh, all the uh, women uh, who are council members who are on the bill as well, including uh, Tish James, our, our public advocate, and soon to be attorney general. Uh, but thank you all, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member William. Council Member Carlos, please. I want to start by uh, thanking Council Member Williams for introducing and reintroducing this uh, legislation and being a leader on this issue on reproductive rights. I want to thank our majority leader, uh, Lori Cumbo, our Women's Committee Chair, uh, Helen Rosenthal, and of course the committee chair uh, for this committee on civil and human rights, uh, Council Member Eugene, who I have the pleasure of sitting with at every city council meeting. Thank you. Uh, I'll just ask a, a quick question. The United States Supreme Court that I don't necessarily feel is very representative of our nation currently and may not be for quite some time, uh, issued a landmark decision, I guess, that will be live in infamy in Hobby Lobby. 
Uh, will this uh, introduction and legisl and if it comes to pass as a law, be able to withstand the scrutiny of Hobby Lobby? And are we as a city able to tell employers that they can no longer force their religious views onto uh, the, the women and, and families of our great city? Um, so these are the kinds of issues that we've been in, in discussion with with the law department, and we hope to have um, some of these deeper conversations um, with council. Um, I, what I will say is that Hobby Lobby was specifically around the provision of health benefits and the requirement that a privately, a closely held private employer um, had to expand their health benefits to include certain, um, whether it was birth control or emergency contraception that they that the private owners disagreed with. Um, um, based on their religion. Here, um, we are not addressing um, the provision of health benefits. It's really about um, prohibiting discrimination, which, um, you know, the city has um, the space to create more protections under the law um, than federal and even state. Um, so we actually, this is this is an area of the law that we have some liberty to sort of go further um, and I, so I think that if we focus it in that way, um, you know, we can construct something and work with the law department and work with the council um, to to create um, a legislation that would withstand uh, scrutiny. But again, we you know this is something that I um, defer to some of the experts at the law department on. As, as an attorney who, and I think every attorney fancies themselves as a constitutional <laughs> lawyer. I imagine the standard we're looking at is strict scrutiny and because we are not legislating specifically with regards to health care but discrimination throughout the whole scope of uh, the employment relationship that that would survive a strict scrutiny test because there is a public purpose in protecting individuals' rights to plan for a family. Would, would you agree? I think that's sort of the framework that we're operating under as well, yes. And, and so what we'd be saying is you can't discriminate uh, if somebody is pregnant, you can discriminate if somebody is no longer pregnant or if a person chooses to become pregnant uh, or engages in any other reproductive health decisions. And similarly, if a employer decided to, 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 I believe in New York State, all health insurance has to cover these pieces. So uh, I guess the only way in which that would happen is if the employer, if it was an employer managed health care program and they tried to somehow discriminate through their health insurance as well as other benefits around that. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Carlos. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, uh, could you expand on your comment about listing specific protection or uh, intentional exclusion and how this uh, can impact the way the law can be interpreted? I'm sorry, um, can you? Uh, could you expand on your comment about listing specific uh, protection or international uh, intentional exclusion and how this impact the way the law can be interpreted. I'm not sure um, I understand the question, but I think the general principle around um, construction of of legislation from from my perspective is we want to make sure that we are um, not if we are intentionally listing certain reproductive health decisions for example that um, if there's an omission it's not it's not interpreted as an intentional omission so that we are um, constructing the bill in such a way that can be interpreted broadly and that any omission may be because you know in 15 years there's a procedure that didn't exist at the time of drafting or um, we hadn't thought of um, that it isn't read to be a, an intentional omission. But uh, with respect to Entro 863, mm -hmm. do you think there is any intentional consequences of this bill that may negatively alter current uh, human rights protection? I can't, I, at this point I cannot envision um, 
any sort of negative interpretation. Um, you know, again, we do want to ensure that we are um, keeping in mind um, some of the constitutional principles that Councilmember Kalos had identified. Um, but again, I think those can be discussed um, more extensively um, in negotiations. But can you also uh, elaborate a little bit more on some of the implication of this bill and its current version? I think the implications of the bill are, are what I think the in, the intent is, which is that um, you know an employer would not be able to uh, terminate an employee or not hire someone or uh, you know cause any other sort of adverse action like a demotion or um, taking responsibilities away um, because they disagree with one's both reproductive or sexual health decisions. Um, I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding, but th that is sort of my understanding of what the bill would do at this at this point. But in our current city uh, human rights law, are you aware of any gaps in our current you know city uh, human rights law? I think in terms of addressing you know uh, discrimination based on uh, on uh, uh, sexual. Uh, uh, health, uh, uh, productive health uh, decision? Well, currently, um, as I mentioned, many of the um, procedures or, or choices that are identified in the, in the bill may already be protected with respect to accommodations um, because of our broad interpretation of the pregnancy, um, childbirth, and related medical conditions language in our law. I should also mention that we have very robust disability discrimination protections for which seeking testing, treatment, or counseling for STIs, including HIV AIDS, would already be protected. Um, so we have existing protections that we can learn from how those have been enforced um, and how advocates and individuals have used those protections to inform our work in this in this space as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we have been joined by Councilmember John. Thank you. And okay, very good. So uh, how does the uh, Commission of Human Rights respond to complaint? about discrimination based on a reproductive choice. Could you drive us through? You sure. Know, when you receive a complaint, what happened? Sure. What, uh, so there's, there's, I would say in this space, there might be two avenues. Um, the first is, particularly with respect to a claim around uh, let's say pregnancy accommodation where someone is in the workplace and they need an accommodation in order to maintain their job or to avoid going on unpaid leave. We have um, an early intervention unit that we've created for these kinds of cases that may require more swift intervention because filing a complaint, rate, waiting for a respondent to re respond, the pregnant worker may be forced to go out on leave during that time. The system, our process is, is just because of the due process issues and the way that our rules are laid out might just take too long for that pregnant worker. So in some circumstances, if that individual is still working and needs an accommodation, the pregnant worker um, will, we will, we will route that to our early intervention unit, which will um, negotiate, hopefully, a resolution with the employer um, so that the individual can get the accommodation that they need. Um, Otherwise, the case might be filed as a complaint, um, which requires that the individual comes in and meet with, meets with an attorney in our law enforcement bureau. Um, that complaint is signed by the complainant and then served on the responding party, and that initiates our investigation. Our investigation will involve looking at documents, interviewing witnesses, um, collecting other forms of evidence, and making an assessment as to whether we believe that there is probable cause that discrimination occurred or not probable cause. Um, at any point in this process, especially if we are leading towards a probable cause determination, we will try to potentially conciliate the case, which is essentially a three-party resolution. The commission is a party, the responding party, and the complaining party. Um, and so we will, it, you know, in the best of circumstances, we will negotiate a settlement for the complainant, which could include damages for lost wages, um, emotional distress damages. It could include... Um, uh, if there's um, back pay or front pay or other expenses, maybe medical expenses, um, then we would um, negotiate whatever civil penalties that individual, the responding party, might have to pay to the city of New York as a punishment or a penalty.
penalty for violating the law. And we might also negotiate uh, policy change, training requirements, um, which we often do, particularly when we identify that the employer has not um, does not have policies in place or training in place to ensure that um, these kinds of cases won't come up again. Um, and so if we don't conciliate the case and we issue a probable cause finding, that case will then enter litigation. Um, during the investigation, the commission is a neutral investigator. Once we find probable cause, the commission is no longer neutral. The commission's interest is in rooting out discrimination, so we would litigate that case in most circumstances on behalf of the complainant um, and bring that case to oath to the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings for a hearing, um, which would involve taking testimony um, from witnesses. And then um, the uh, oath judge, the ALJ, would, would issue a report and recommendation. And our commissioner, the Office of the Commissioner chair and Chair, would issue a decision in order, a final decision in order in the case. But again, most cases don't go through the full litigation process, as most cases in litigation in federal or state court don't, and the case might resolve at any point along that along that process. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, I know that we know that, that you know, we may have good intent, we may be dedicated and work hard to address an issue, but there are always some challenges, always, regardless how good we may be. And, and uh, what are the challenges and the obstacles faced by the commission when trying to address uh, the discrimination based on uh, uh, reproductive choices? Um, well, again, at this point, I'm, I can only really report a, around our experience enforcing the law with respect to pregnancy or disability because th that, those are the laws that we have. Um, and I think we are continually faced with the challenge of being flexible in our enforcement. Like I said, our, our agency has a litigation type function. So it's a long, it can be a long process. Um, and a lot of people are busy with many commitments and to engage in another sort of administrative system is not workable for a lot of people. And the, and the time it takes to process cases can, can be lengthy. Again, because we have specific um, structures and mechanisms in place to ensure due process. Um, so that is one of the challenges that we face and, and we've, we've made efforts to become a little bit more flexible with how we enforce the law. Again, creating an early intervention unit so that we can try to negotiate resolutions earlier. Um, it may just be a call from the commission um, saying, are you aware of the law? Do you know what your obligations are? That might be enough to get a, a, an issue resolved. But I think we are continually challenged with creating systems that um, acknowledge how busy people are and um, and also how urgent some of these claims might be. Uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, Dana Sussman, thank you so very much for your testimony. Thank you. thank you. And thank you for the wonderful job that you are doing on behalf of the people of New York to ensure that the right of everyone is respected. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Have a nice day. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we want to call uh, Sarah Sanchala from Planned Parenthood, New York City. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name morning. is Sarah Sanchala, and I'm the Director of Government Relations at Planned Parenthood of New York City. Um, I would like to thank Committee Chair Eugene for holding this hearing, and Council Member Williams for sponsoring this legislation, and the entire committee for your um, dedication to addressing this important issue. Planned Parenthood of New York City supports the passage of Intro 863, which would prohibit employer discrimination on the basis of sexual and reproductive health decisions. <coughs> Planned Parenthood of New York City has been a leading provider of sexual and reproductive health services for over 100 years. Thousands of New Yorkers depend on our essential services each year. We firmly believe that all people deserve access to quality, affordable, and compassionate health care, as well as the right to exert control over their reproductive choices. It is critical that New Yorkers are able to access this care without experiencing retaliation from their employers. 
86% of Americans support policies that make it easier to access the full range of birth control options. Despite this overwhelming support for and widespread use of birth control, employers continue to try to discriminate against employees who rely on birth control as well as many other essential sexual and reproductive health services. Additionally, the Trump administration has created a hostile landscape for access to sexual and reproductive health care through gag rules, attacks on Title X, and other dangerous tactics. Given this reality, it has never been more critical for New York to stand up for sexual and reproductive health care access. New York should be a leader in progressive policies that recognize the rights of all people to make their own choices about their bodies, their future, and health, and to live free from employer discrimination. Planned Parenthood of New York City is proud to support the Boss Bill and be part of the efforts to ensure access to sexual and reproductive health services, regardless of gender, sexual orientation, immigration status, or ability to pay. We applaud Council Member Williams for introducing this bill, which would ensure that people are able to access medical care from fertility treatment to birth control to abortion without workplace retaliation. We look forward to continuing to be a resource and partner moving forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh Thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Sanchara. Thank you. Thank you. But um, could you tell us what issues are related to discrimination based on reproductive choice are uh, you hearing from your client when you receive? Um, I, I can People who go to your organization, to the Plain Brownwood, Hood, what type of issues or complaints they bring to you? We get a lot of them. Um, I, I can get you specific examples um, uh, reg regarding specifically employment or, or just the patients in the general. Discrimination in, their lives. in general, discrimination based on, you know, on the, the, the reproductive uh, decision or situation, let's put it not decision, but situation. Because they are taking treatment or because they are pregnant, because they have to go for uh, some uh, medical treatment or services. Tell us about exactly, you know, from your experience, what type of uh, uh, complaint or cases or issues that your organization is dealing with? I, I don't actually have any specific case examples to share with you right now, but I'm happy to report back with you after I'll check in with our clinical team. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, the services that you are providing, could you tell us about the services that uh, Plain Proudwood is providing, just in a little bit in detail? Yeah, so... That may help people... Yeah, you know, I'm. Yeah, I mean, we we are facing you know discrimination or as a preventive measure or yeah. Yeah, I mean, so we provide the wide range of services for for um, sexual and reproductive health. So it's um, birth control, emergency contraception, gynecological care, breast cancer screenings, colonoscopy. Um, the list goes on. Um, I, I think we provide, I'm just looking at the data here, we have uh, last year we provided 64,206 sexual and reproductive health care visits, 5,884 5, pregnancy tests, um, in addition to 90, over 90,000 tests for STIs and 32,000 for HIV tests. Um, so I think in general we see a wide range of clients. Um, we both have a mobile unit and health centers around the city in each of the boroughs and so so um, we, some of our some of our clients and patients are are people who don't have permanent housing and don't have have sort of the traditional uh, life ex life uh, trajectories that um, everyone else has right now. So um, the range of impacts is great, and and we're able to provide the service regardless of of any other barriers that they're facing. So I think that there are a lot of other barriers in people's lives that that bring them to us because we're easy to access. But based on your experience, you know, serving people, and do you have any suggestion on how we can strengthen the protection of reproductive choices? Anything that you think that should yeah, be I'm, done? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to and not be snarky about the federal administration. But if you don't, if you, um, if you, don't, if you <laughs> so. don't think about any, but you can always you know, forward the... Yeah, I mean, right now, honestly, some of our biggest, the, yeah, some of our biggest attacks are from the federal administration, um, mm -hmm. cuts to funding, cut to services, okay. um, the public charge, which I know there was a hearing last week, um, and I think that some of these initiatives, like Intro 863, are ways that the city can sort of counter some of these attacks where the feds are failing and or adding additional burdens. The city is is able to step in and, and add these protections. Okay, very much. And oh, Councilmember William, please. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support of this bill and all the services uh, that you do uh, at Planned Parenthood. Um, 
my uh, my only question was, did you? I don't know if it was it was surprising to hear that the expansion that was recommended by the, the deputy commissioner around housing and uh, public accommodations was that something you had thought of? Did it make sense? Did you have any possible examples of how that might work? Yeah, I mean, I can obviously go back and talk with our team. We are primarily a sexual and reproductive health care organization, and so we tend to focus on the clients and the medical provision of care. Um, but again, we see clients who are impacted by housing and other um, concerns, and so um, I, we would definitely love to continue to have that conversation as you continue it with the commission. I think it sounds, it sounds interesting to expand. Okay, thank you so much again for your support. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member William. Uh, Ms. Uh, Sarah Sanchella, thank you very much for your testimony. And thank you also, I want to uh, thank your organization, uh, the uh, Planned Parenthood of New York City, for the services uh, you, all of you, are providing to the people in New York because this is a very important issue or uh, field. Sexual and reproductive you know, uh, 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 services are very, very important. And I'm saying that because you know I know firsthand what it what it means you know for somebody who has uh, a medical background. So this is very important that we come together, we help people because some of the time that could be a very difficult, very difficult situation, big challenges for people who are going through those uh, situations. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, you too, and I'll get back to you with some examples. So since there is no other panel and no other question, the meeting is adjourned.